welcome back. I hope you all had an excellent lunch. Um, before we get underway, there's a small piece of housekeeping. A hotel key has been found and handed in at Rego. So if you are missing your hotel key, uh, Reg desk. Um, but we are now here to, um, to hear about raising heretics on a diet of open data with Dr. Linda McIver. Uh, Linda is a passionate educator, researcher, and advocate for STEM equity and inclusion with a PhD in computer science education. Her mission is to ensure all Australian students have the opportunity to learn STEM and data science skills in the context of projects that empower them to solve problems and make a di positive difference in the world. Today, Linda will talk about the integration of data science into education and the potential social outcomes of using real-world data when teaching. Thanks, Fiona. Um, I would like to apologise for delivering the talk standing, uh, sitting down. I'd like to be standing up. Um, unfortunately, standing up for 45 minutes is not a function currently offered by this API. Um, similarly, I'm not going to be at much of the conference, um, uh, much as I'd like to catch up with you all. Um, feel free to find me on any of the social things um, and, and connect and really like that. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the first scientists, the first environmentalists uh, and the traditional owners of these unceded lands, the Wurundjeri people, um, the Wur Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people, I'm terrible at pronouncing that, I apologize, of the Kulin Nation. Uh, we have much to learn from them. So ChatGPT has the education world's uh, collective underwear in a knot. <laughs> this is largely because it threatens the validity of our assessment. Uh, it gives students the possibility of uh, dodging their assignment work, their um, writing, their research, and sometimes even dodging sitting their own exams. Many state education departments in Australia have uh, banned it from schools entirely. And let's have a moment's collective silence for governments that are naive enough to believe they can ban something on the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> the truth is, though, that it only threatens the validity of our assessment because our assessments are already wildly invalid. Uh, we know that the way we are assessing people doesn't work and doesn't actually assess the characteristics and skills and um, abilities that we say we care about. Our tasks for students are all too often chosen for um, ease of processing, ease of marking, ease of authentication. Uh, it's very easy to know if a student is sitting in front of you writing on an exam paper that you can be fairly confident that they're writing, uh, that they're doing their own work, although that even that's getting a little dodgy these days. Um, but there's very little evidence that exams are actually a worthwhile uh, form of assessment. In fact, we know that they're not. They're not a good way of assessing student learning. And let's face it, when you choose a doctor, you don't ask them how well they did on their exams. You want to know how good they are at communicating. You want to have someone who's an excellent diagnostician, who's fabulous at um, collaborating with uh, professionals in, in various allied health um, professions and also other doctors. You want to know that uh, that your doctor is good at choosing a specialist who will actually treat you like a human being and not like a speck under a microscope. Um, you don't care about the ATAR. But none of these things are effectively assessed by exams and they're also not replicable by things like ChatGPT. If our assessment of students' learning and skills is based on assessments that ask them to regurgitate facts and known processes, we're not actually assessing anything of value. There's just no validity there at all. So I'm hoping that ChatGPT will be the kick that we need to push us into uh, more authentic forms of assessment, uh, into more engaging, useful and valid ways of education. It's past time to transition to a problem-based, authentic form of education where students actually do things that build their critical thinking their problem solving, uh, and indeed their ethical decision making. Why am I telling you this in a conference on open data? Well, when I started computer science, uh, when I started teaching computer science in a secondary school, I arrived to find a course that was um, very toy based. We had year 10 students, we were teaching them to teach robots to push each other out of circles, to follow lines, to um, draw pretty pictures in scratch based interfaces. 
uh, and it failed. It failed dismally. The students hated it. And this was in a science school where you would think that the kids were you know, naturally predisposed to enjoy technology and to engage with it, but they couldn't see the point. Um, they couldn't see the relevance to anything that they would want to do in their future lives. They were bored, they were disengaged, and they were wholly unwilling. Now, when we switched to using data science instead, uh, we were teaching the same coding skills. They were learning about variables and functions and iteration and you know, basic code. Uh, but now we were doing it in the context of real data sets. And that, that, the word, that, that second last word there is key, real data sets. As soon as you use data that is real and meaningful, it completely changes the nature of the education. So we were also teaching a large side of data literacy, but um, for me, you know, I'm a computer scientist. I want everyone to learn to code. For me, this started out as a quest to engage more kids with code. Um, and sorry, I was mildly distracted there by the sight of a helicopter going down below the floor level. It's gone now, but <laughs> um, you don't see that very often. Um, so, uh, yeah, we were using those data sets to answer meaningful questions and the level of engagement completely changed. Suddenly, instead of coming to me saying, why are you making me do this? I don't want to do this. I hate this. And, you know, half of them, to be honest, cheating to just get the assignment out of the way and move on with it. Now they were coming to me saying, oh, my God, this is so useful. I used it in my science project. And to be honest, those science projects are half the reason I started teaching data, because every year the graphs in their science projects made me cry. <laughs> but now they're also coming to me saying, oh, I used it in my maths exam, and oh my God, there was a graph on the news last night, and there was no zero on the scale, and it was so outrageous, it was so... <laughs> <laughs> so suddenly, just because they were working with real data and learning some data literacy, they were becoming critical thinkers, and that thread just grew and grew and grew to the point where I didn't care about them learning coding anymore. The critical thinking and the problem solving was actually the significant part. Um, so, we talk a lot about boosting the pipeline. We talk about getting more women and non-binary folks into uh, tech in general and data science in particular. But the problem is we tend to focus our efforts on um, late high school when the kids are starting to, as we nominally call it, choose their careers, although I'm sure there are plenty of people in this room who would who, uh, provide evidence that you can change your career at any point, <laughs> um, myself included. Um, but we, we focus on late uh, high school or university. And the problem with that is that we know that kids' attitudes to STEM and maths in particular solidify in uh, mid to early to mid primary school. We've lost them before they ever hit high school. So kids' interest in STEM is really caught or lost in those early years. But the trouble is they're often being taught by teachers who've never learned STEM themselves. Uh, who've never been taught to teach STEM and who are, quite frankly, often terrified of it. Uh, coincidentally, perhaps, um, kids' own self-efficacy or their perception of their self-efficacy um, solidifies around that time too. So you get kids coming out of primary school saying, I am no good at maths. I am no good at tech. I couldn't do anything with those robots. Um, and they're being taught by teachers who are terrified of it. There may be a connection. Um, so. We need to stop aiming our recruitment drives at high school when we've already lost them. Because yes, okay, it makes sense to aim at high school when they're choosing their subjects and things. Uh, and they are choosing their path at that point. But the truth is, they've already pruned a lot of those paths. They're already saying, I'm not doing maths because I suck at maths. Um, and both my kids, by the way, don't tell them I told you this, um, test is gifted in maths, but believe they suck at it because, um, they, <laughs> because they frequently misinterpret the questions. Um, and they're badly worded questions, but that's a, a rant for another time. Um, if you want to jump in at any point, please feel free. There will be plenty of time for questions at the end, but if you want to jump in at some point, just uh, make yourself known. Um, yeah, so we need to teach these kids much earlier that STEM skills are meaningful, that they're useful, and really importantly, we need to teach them that they're accessible, that they can all do them. Um, this, this kind of only a certain type of person can code thing, the, the coding DNA kind of 
myth is really pervasive, um, not just in society, but also in tech, as I'm sure you know. Um, but it's not. Anyone can learn to code. Anyone can learn data science. Anyone can learn STEM skills. Now, I'm not saying that I'm going to turn all these kids into data scientists, uh, but they all need to have enough data literacy to engage with the meaningful conversations we all need to have about where we're going as a society, because data science is increasingly driving that in some interesting directions. So we know that one way to engage kids with STEM is to use data science, solving real problems. So clearly we need to bring data science into schools from the very beginning. Well, I have good news and for you, I have great news. The good news is we're already building that data science into education. That's why I started the Australia Data Science Education Institute and it is starting to spread. We're getting there, we're developing resources and sharing um, lesson plans and doing teacher training and getting out there into the world. Um, but the great news is that open data gives us the power um, to use school data science projects to um, solve serious data problems. We all know there's more data out there than any, um, than, than the field of data science can analyze, even if we collectively forego sleep and food forever. Uh, hands up if you've heard of the Japanese term tsundoku the stack of books that you have beside your bed that you haven't got around to reading yet. Now put your hands up if you have your own personal data tsundoku. <laughs> right. <laughs> we just can't get to it. That's too much. Um, so how about we throw kids some of that data? How about we get them answering real questions and doing meaningful stuff? It's more than possible. Um, I do it every day. So uh, the challenge is to do things like, what if we taught probability using gender pay data sets instead of black and white urns, uh, black and white balls in an urn. Um, Charlie is a non-binary software engineer. Given that they've been working in the field for three years, what is the probability that they are receiving the same pay as James, a cis white man doing the same job? <laughs> but of course, we need open pay data in order to answer that question. And the pay gap, the gender pay gap data that is being released is not sufficient. That's a conversation for another time. The amazing thing about using real data sets for classroom projects is that the possibility exists for kids to find new things. So they could be looking at a data set that no one's ever looked at or asking that data set a question that no one's ever asked. That's not something they get to do at school. They normally get to solve problems that have been solved before and where they take it up to the teacher and the teacher goes, yes or no. Yes, it's right. No, it's wrong. Do some more work. That's the extent of it. But now they're doing real science with data sets that haven't been fully analyzed. So they have the chance to ask questions no one's asked before. The first data science project I ran uh, with my year 10s used a data set from the Australian Electoral Commission. And we downloaded a CSV file, which was over 3 million lines. Every line in that CSV file was a vote for the Senate in Victoria for the federal election. Um, and 3 million lines weren't even open in Excel. So Gosh darn it, they had to learn to code. So sorry. <laughs> um, mind you, the code they had to write might have been 10 or 20 lines in the end. They were very simple um, bits of analysis that most of them did. But being a real data set with endless scope, those who were ready for it could do and did insanely complicated and fabulous things. Um, so they weren't learning a lot of code but they were learning a manageable, blah, 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 a manageable amount um, that enabled them to do something real. Imagine if everybody's first experience with code was a small, bit, a small program that did something meaningful and enabled them to find something out that they cared about. That would be a bit different to Hello World. Um, so the assignment was to find a question the data set could answer. Now, there were just endless scope for that. Um, and visualize the results. Now, the visualizations were mostly done by hand, um, partly because Python visualization libraries um, setting kids, new coders free on Python visualization libraries ends in tears. I mean, those libraries make me cry. Um, but also because they could do much more creative and compelling things if they visualized it by hand. Um, so then you have to think about whether the graph is still valid, the visualization is valid, you know, making sure that things are to scale and stuff. Um, but they learn a lot more making the visualizations more interesting um, to, to their general audience. Every student had to find a different question. Now, that's a problem 
really, if you think about it for, for the way we normally do education, that's 180 different questions of this data set, none of which the teacher already knows the answer to. We'll talk about that in a minute. But some of the questions they asked were, how did the people at my local polling booth vote compared to the people in the electorate as a whole or in Victoria as a whole? Uh, what was the proportion of women as candidates and how much of the vote did they get compared to the men? And that was a particularly interesting one because we got to examine the thorny question of gendering people by their first name uh, and whatever you could find out with Google. And it you know, was a fabulous introduction to the complexity and ugliness of, of real data, the messiness. Um, they asked which parties did people vote for who voted above the line or which parties did people mostly vote for who voted below the line, which parties were more likely to receive the second preference of people who voted one for any given party, um, where are Pauline Hansen's One Nation voters, metro, urban or rural, which party's voters were more likely to follow, yeah, that was not a big surprise, um, <laughs> which, <laughs> which party's voters were more likely to follow the how to vote cards, uh, won't surprise you to know that Green's voters were the most rebellious in that respect. <laughs> um, in short, they got to take a large data set and ask the questions that um, most interested them. And that data set had only just been released. It was just after the 2016 federal election. So a lot of these questions hadn't been asked at all and, and indeed were never asked by anybody else because they were quite specific. Um, and the focus was very much on the data literacy aspect. What questions can this data set answer? Because of course, the first thing they all want to know is um, which is the best party? And sadly, I don't think that data set answered that question. Yes. <laughs> This is absolutely fascinating research in and of itself. Did you publish their work anywhere? Sadly, there, uh, the question was, did, did I publish the work anywhere? Because it's, it's amazing research and it is amazing research. And um, sadly, there are real complexities around publishing things with real kids and blah, blah, blah. So uh, no, uh, yes, I'd love to. The former academic in me really wants to research this, but at the same time as teaching it and spreading it. And yeah, yeah, yeah there's a, I, ran out of, I ran out of means. Um, yeah, so the focus was on how do we communicate the answers to those questions accurately and compellingly? Like, how do we get people to care about this stuff that you found out? And I picked this data set because I had a student who was really interested in politics. So I went and rummaged on the AEC website to see what I could find. I was like, this one's great. Uh, it was particularly good because you'd explain the rules of Senate voting to kids, you know, like you can vote above the line or below the line, but not both. And, um, you know, you can only use the number one once and things like that. And so they go, great. So if I look at this, this string, which contains the votes, there'll only be one number one. I'm like, well, the thing you have to also deal with is that people don't necessarily follow the rules and boom, their little heads explode. It's a wonderful learning experience. Um, but uh, the thing is that even the kids who weren't interested in politics were super interested in the fact that this was real and they could easily see the connection to things that they did care about and how they could use these skills that they were learning for something that mattered to them more. Um, this turns out to be central to motivation. Kids who can't see the point in learning something don't. It's as simple as that. Um, and making it fun is very dependent on your definition of fun. <laughs> there is no single thing that every student will find fun, uh, but also robots, um, they are preaching to the converted. The kids who love robots will love robots, the kids who don't will not. <laughs> it's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, but if you're using real data, they can see the relevance and they can apply it to other things, um, even if that particular data set doesn't do it for them. And the cool thing is when we use real data sets, there are a lot of questions to ask before you even begin to analyze them. Questions like, how was the data collected? What are the problems or limitations of the way the data was collected? What was the sample size? What biases are embodied in this data? What were the limitations of any sensors used? Has the data been processed at all? And if so, what, what information was lost in the processing? What does each of the fields mean? How do the fields relate to each other? So you've got to understand the domain of the data, which is not the way we typically teach maths. We typically teach maths with, here are some numbers, here is a process, apply the process to the numbers and tell us the result. Not, well, it depends on the type of seagrass that you're measuring, that, that's not a part of maths. Um, and this is my favorite, and this has particularly come out of my, one of my podcasts, which I'll talk about a bit in a minute, but um, what definitions underpin this data? 
because the devil is absolutely in the definitions. Um, I mentioned the gender pay gap data before. Um, one of the issues with that data, for there are many, I, I, I love that it's released, right? But it's not the panacea that um, some people have, have said it is because part-timers are not included in that data. Now, who is typically part-time? <clears throat> Correct. So, you know, the assumptions that have been made in the definitions and the, you know, who's in and who's out can be very significant in the results that you get. And that is, that's a bit mind-bending for people who've been taught that things are black and white and, you know, very straightforward and you get the same result every time. So already you're starting a data literacy conversation that builds critical thinking and problem solving skills and we haven't even opened the file yet. I love that, that you know, that they, they really have to start thinking about things before they even get down to work. We have a tendency as human beings to kind of bend at the knees when we see a graph or some statistics, but teaching data science, da, teaching data science using real data sets builds um, a culture of rational skepticism that makes it normal to ask, what was the sample size? How did you collect that data? Where did it come from? How reliable is it? What biases might there be? And we all need to be asking those questions by default and we tend not to. Um, <laughs> my kids and my students curse me because they can't look at things like that without, without asking those questions anymore. And, you know, it's like once your eyes are opened, you, you can't close them again, which I love, but it's also kind of distressing. <laughs> Um, of course, yeah, there are challenges. If you have 180 kids asking different questions of a data set, you have 180 answers which aren't in the back of the textbook. That, to me, is an upside, not a downside. Because now, instead of taking it to the teacher and asking us if it's correct or looking it up in the back of the textbook or hitting the submit button and finding out whether you've got the right answer, now what do you have to do? You have to check your own work. You have to critically evaluate your own work. You have to figure out why you think it's valid, challenge it, test it to see if it is valid, um, figure out what other explanations there might be for the results that you got. All of these wonderful things that we don't normally do in schools, and in fact, we don't normally do them in real life either. Um, so not only are they learning to be rationally skeptical about data, but they're also learning to be rationally skeptical about their own work and to assume that there will be flaws in their own work. Because when you're using real data sets and solving real problems, there is no such thing as a perfect solution. So now you have to evaluate your solution. And, and, and I, I think that's magnificent. And it wasn't something I thought about when I started doing data. Like I said, when I started teaching data science, I just wanted them to make better graphs and learn to code. That, it turns out, is not the important stuff. So when we give kids real things to do, and the power to create change. They see the purpose of tech and data science skills, and they're eager to learn. Black and white balls in an urn or teaching robots to push each other out of circles just doesn't cut it, doesn't have nearly the same impact. And the more open data we have, the more data sets that kids can play with themselves and figure stuff out with, the greater the potential for projects that empower kids to make change in their own communities. So imagine kids exploring pedestrian data in their local town centre, um, or tracking COVID cases in their community if that data were available, which it no longer is. Um, imagine them evaluating the impact of nearby development on threatened species, or looking at the impact of dredging in Port Phillip Bay on dolphin numbers and behaviour. Imagine them analysing traffic around their school and devising safer traffic management processes for drop-off and pick-up time or using Google mobility data to analyze COVID lockdowns and figure out um, which uh, country really had the longest and strictest lockdowns in the world. Or, um, or using public health and road accident data to try and figure out which is really the most dangerous to the population in the long term, cycling or inactivity. Imagine, well, imagine exploring real current data on anything the kids care about. That's, it's, it's as simple as that. And as someone who's currently mobility impaired, I'm fascinated and enraged by how much further all the accessible stuff is. You have to walk further for the lift. You have to walk further to press the button to make the automatic door open. Um, the 
ambulant toilets in in the Lowe's are always way down the other end. Like it just every step some days is incredibly painful and I have to take way more of them to use the stuff that's designed to make my life easier. So imagine if we had kids doing a project just around their school or around their local shopping center or um, park to figure out how much further people in wheelchairs have to go to access the same things um, that the rest of us take for granted. Or um, what about a project where kids measure, track, or try to fix anything that um, is, gets in the way of people who are vision impaired? Uh, uneven footpaths, low-hanging signs, which, by the way, are also a problem for the um, clumsier tall people among us. Hi. Um, or measure and track accessibility on websites. What about a project to track the use of alt tags on Mastodon uh, and compare it with Twitter? Um, really, when you start thinking this way, there's just no end to the kinds of projects that kids can do and the topics that they could take on. And the, the cool thing is kids want to do something real. They want to make a difference. Um, when they ask, why do I learn this? They don't actually want the answer because it's on the exam. They, they want to know how it's meaningful and that's just fundamentally meaningful. Uh, it's, it's just built in. Um, so every project, when the kids come up with solutions because there's no textbook answer and they can't look it up in the back of the book or compare it with the teacher's answer sheet, they have to evaluate their own solutions. They have to ask, who does it help? Who does it harm? Does it actually make things better? How could we improve it? Imagine if that was the standard approach to programs in government. Be a bit radical. None of these are easy questions. Uh, none of them have easy answers, but that's fantastic preparation for the real world where easy questions and obvious answers are conspicuous by their absence or deeply suspicious when they're presented to you. Um, and the Australian Data Science Education Institute is building these kinds of projects, um, using open data or getting kids to collect their own data about problems in their local area. For kids as young as five years old, you can do stuff. The kids, they're graphing by stacking blocks. It's, it's great fun. Um, we're building their critical thinking, rational skepticism and STEM skills from the very start of their education. And we're teaching them that they have the power to change the world and that STEM skills enhance that power. A friend of mine recently hired a newly graduated data scientist and he came to her deeply distressed at one point saying, my data set, like, I don't understand what's going wrong. The curve is really wonky. And my friend looked at it, fortunately, she's an experienced statistician. She was like, yeah, that's, that's how real data comes out. This guy had a master's in data science and had never seen a curve that didn't come out perfectly. I mean, that's an outrageous indictment on that master's program, and I don't know which university it is, but could probably have been any of them. Um, and I wonder if poor brain exploded on contact with real data. Like, that's just, we, we should, we should never be using textbook data sets because they don't exist in the real world. It's, it's just outrageous. So you have to bear in mind, of course, that not every school project will produce tangible great outcomes or usable outcomes. Sometimes a school project, you know, disappears at the end of the semester and that's all there is to it, which is fine. The fascinating thing is that just knowing that they're working on something real um, and meaningful give, gives kids a mind-blowing level of motivation and engagement. And it makes it easier for them to imagine how the skills that they're learning could be used elsewhere. Even though they're learning the same essential skills, at least where coding is concerned, um, they just, they can transfer them much more easily. And also, you know, they're using Python, not Mindstorm. So the, the transference is easier because there's a lot of stuff happening in Python. Open data combined with this kind of data science education gives students the power to change the world and ask all those really difficult questions. That's why I called it Raising Heretics and I have a book by the same name. It's, we're really teaching kids to ask difficult questions, which a lot of people don't like. I was, I was in a, a teacher, conference and I talked about how, you know, we, we should be challenging the validity of the assessments. And one of the teachers was like, oh, you better not tell the kids that. They must start challenging the validity of assessments. I'm like, yes, go for it. It's like, Ooh. So not everyone's ready for it. Um, but as open data enthusiasts, I charge you with a few things that will help us turn your data into school projects. Number one, please annotate your data for non-experts. 
if you have a CSV file with fields labeled things like F6642G, uh, it may be open, but it's not really accessible. So um, please provide a data dictionary if you can that, that explains every field in a clear and non-specialist language, together with as much information as you can about how the data was collected and, um, and any processing that's been done to it. Use uh, non-proprietary formats if you possibly can. CSV is ideal. Um, we can't make any assumptions about available software, hardware, or even internet in schools. Uh, sometimes we are reduced to sneaker net. Which brings me to, if your data set is massive, if you can provide meaningful subsets, that's super helpful. So for example, I broke the Google Mobility data down for Australia into states, um, which is a you know, simple, super simple Python script for me, but it's out of the reach of a lot of teachers and, and a lot of students. So it just makes it a little easier for them to dive in without having to do all the prep work. And the thing about the prep work is I had time to do it when I was teaching because I was half time. Also, I already had the skills. Most teachers, full-time teachers don't have that time. They don't have time to find the data, make sense of it, build a project. Uh, it's one of the reasons I created ADSI to try to short circuit that for them so they can just grab the data. It's pre-annotated, grab lesson plans and things like that. Uh, number four, be open and explicit um, about the issues and limitations of your data. That's super helpful. And also this is going up on my blog as soon as I'm done here. So um, you don't have to write it down if you want to look for it. It'll be up on the ADSI website, which I will give you the link to in a minute. It's up there, in fact. Um, yeah, talk about patches where there's data missing or where sensors failed or where the internet got, uh, went down or biases in the sample, anything like that is super helpful to know. Uh, and please, please, please do not clean your data. I want kids to be working with the messy stuff to understand that people don't always follow the rules when they're voting for the Senate and you know, all that stuff. Um, real, messy, complicated data sets are the best possible preparation for the real, messy, complicated real world. Um, we need to really stop teaching kids that questions have simple answers. It's not a thing. Uh, instead, we want to equip them to handle real life. So uh, number six, provide contact information if you can. If you're uncomfortable with doing that or your data set is so exciting that you fear you're gonna be um, inundated, please feel free to use me as an intermediary. Um, contact me first. <laughs> um, but I'm happy for you to put my contact details. This is part of what I do, right? It's part of what ADSI does. Put, we'll put up ADSI as a contact and um, then you at least will only have to answer the questions that I can't answer and only answer them once. Um, so that's always an option. Uh, when I was working with the AEC data, I spent hours on the phone to the AEC trying to find someone who could confirm for me the mapping of the uh, one-dimensional string to the two-dimensional ballot paper, and I could not find anyone there who knew. Presumably there is somebody, um, but I couldn't find them, and it took me hours, and teachers don't have that kind of time. Um, yeah. A key part of ADSI's mission, thank you, is to relieve teachers of the burden of finding those interesting data sets and figuring them out, as well as helping teach them how to do this stuff. Long term, the goal is to put ADSI out of business because it'll be the way teachers teach, it'll be the way teachers are trained to teach, and it'll be the way the curriculum has written. It's going to take a minute or two. So in the meantime, ADSI is a charity because funding must never be a barrier to access. Uh, the road to social equality is educational equality, um, which means that we do charge, but those who can't afford to pay don't. And it also means that we're always strapped for cash. So uh, please feel free to sling us some money if you can. There we go. Um, the more authentic and meaningful data that we have access to, the more kids we can empower to change the world using data science. So please put them up on all the data repositories you can find. Send them straight to me or send me a link. Let me know that they're there. It's super helpful and gives kids access to much more interesting projects. Um, I do have a book where you can read more of this stuff. It's free as a podcast. Um, which is really just an audio book, but with lower sound quality. Um, and it's also, you can buy it all over the place. Um, I also have a podcast called Make Me Data Literate. If you do funky stuff with data, um, sing out and I'll have you on because it's, it's really fun. Um, 
and it's a it, it's just interesting chats with people who do cool stuff with data and i think there's a few new google audience here i'm like oh i haven't got you on there yet um um one more thing talk to me questions uh, fiona's going to come around with the microphone so we can all hear on your website, do you have a some links to data that you've previously used that you like or things that we can get a kickstart with? Yes, uh, the website is severely in need of updating, like all good websites. Um, but yes, there are there's, there's projects and, and existing data sets on there. There will be more eventually. Seems like showing myself. This sounds really exciting for kids. I was wondering if you have any advice for the adults who got left behind who want to learn this stuff? Um, there's a whole bunch of ways to learn data science online. Um, but, but again, I would say find yourself a problem that, that is meaningful to you and try to figure that out and build your skills that way um, because you're more likely to stick to it for a start because it's interesting to you. Um, I'm working with a company called Grok Academy who build um, a whole bunch of uh, online coding courses and stuff. They are building some data science courses as well, which I am involved with. Um, and so there's some useful sort of data literacy and data science skills coming online. They're not there yet, but they will be. Um, uh, they're free now um, because they got a whole bunch of funding. So um, it's not a bad place to start, but really find something you're interested in and, and sort of dig into it that way. Also, there is a Facebook group called Teachers Using Data Science, which you can jump into even if you're not a teacher and ask questions in there. Um, teachers love to tell people stuff. <laughs> it's a thing. Are there any more questions for Linda? Um, one of the things I hear from teachers all the time is, but, but how do I fit this into the curriculum? I have to teach the <laughs> curriculum. And the curriculum is a slow moving um, thing. And do you have any interesting stories or anecdotes about things that you've been able to get teachers to do to make it? The simplest thing is that all the projects are curriculum linked. So actually, any one of these real projects, you can hit curriculum points from like 50 different subjects um and so you know i did a bunch of projects for the education department in victoria a few years ago and we literally had five or six different rubrics for you know english and maths and science and geography and because they you know as soon as you're using a real data set you're covering a lot of different points so it's not hard um, to build it into the curriculum that they need to teach anyway the, the real challenge is persuading teachers that they have the skills they need to do this, which is why most of what I do is in spreadsheets um, when I'm training teachers. Because if I walk into a room of teachers and say, I'm going to teach you all the code in Python, there'll be a whisking noise. I'll be like, where did everybody go? <laughs> um, it's, there, are, there are teachers out there doing amazing stuff in Python, but they're very, very outnumbered. Um, and so if I'm trying to engage science teachers and math teachers and history teachers and geography teachers, actually geography teachers are all over this stuff. They're amazing. Um, but I need to show them that they've already got the skills and you can do really simple stuff in spreadsheets, um, which is, again, where the subsets of data come in handy because we can do stuff in spreadsheets and not have to code. Ultimately, everyone will code, but one step at a time. So in addition to the whisking noise the teachers make when they're scurrying out of the room, what other type of um, resistance or sort of refusal have you encountered throughout this entire journey that you've been on? Uh, the biggest thing is if I label my workshops as data science workshops, I get no sign-ups. If I label them as STEM workshops, are they sell out. <laughs> Same content. Um, it is the fear factor. Uh, but also, you know, I... I I've sometimes worked with schools where a head of department, like a head of science has said, everyone must work with Linda and there's crickets. And then he says, please contact Linda and set up a time, crickets. And then one person does it. And the, f the first time I did that, the person who came to me came looking like she was going to die. Like she was like, you know, lamb to the slaughter. You know, she was pretty sure she was walking into a bloodbath. And I sat, sat her down and went through what she was already doing. She's a chem teacher, an excellent chem teacher. And I was like, so when you're doing errors, we could do this. And she's like, oh, I do that. And, you know, just the, the, the weight fell off her shoulders and she kind of sat up straight again. 
um, it really is, the, the fear factor is just the big thing. Um, so it's, it's getting past that. And that's, you know, as much a sociology and marketing exercise as it is anything else. Um, I, and it's kind of helps to have um, a, a mole in the school, <laughs> someone who's already, you know, a double agent spreading the word kind of thing. That works really well. Um, I vaguely recall that there's a sort of two streams in Victorian curriculum. There's a kind of technology is something that we use as a tool and it's everywhere. And then there's the technology curriculum. Where do you, do you, do you find that that complicates it or do you have a kind of way of dealing with both of them? Or? I think that's a really weird set up and I always have, but I don't, I don't particularly care about the, the faculties or the divisions because this stuff should be in all of the subjects. You can, I've seen a really cool project that analyzes um, different characters appearing in Harry Potter books. I wouldn't do Harry Potter now, but you know, you could like just, it's just, it's like a kind of visual display of where the characters are most likely to appear in the books and which characters appear on the same page and things like that. Like there's all kinds of stuff you can do. There's a wonderful history project using the Titanic data set, um, which is a readily available text file, which has um, the, the name, the age, the sex, the um, class, and in some cases the occupation of the passengers and crew on the Titanic and whether they lived or died. So you can analyze it and say, well, did women and ch children really go first? Um, things like that. And that's history. And it doesn't require a lot of maths either. Okay, I think we're at time. So would you all join with me, please, in thanking Linda for a very thought-provoking <laughs> session. <laughs>